a new leader. Archbishop Jose Gomez with 176 is elected the new president. The head of the Diocese of Los Angeles is elected president of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. We have a report and reaction from Archbishop Jose Gomez. Battle on the border. The Supreme Court hears arguments on whether to allow the Trump administration to roll back an Obama-era program on immigration. Anti-government protests. Another round of clashes between demonstrators and police in Hong Kong. And a good fit. Tailors in Thailand are preparing for Pope Francis' visit later this month. On EWTN News Nightly for Tuesday, November 12, 2019. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you for joining us for News from a Catholic Perspective. I'm Wyatt Goolsby. The U.S. bishops elect a new president in a historic vote. Los Angeles Archbishop Jose Gomez moves up from vice president to take the reins and become their first Latino to hold the top position. We'll talk with him in a few minutes, but first, correspondent Jason Calvi takes us to Baltimore as the bishops debate what advice they should give Catholic voters for 2020. As Americans jump into a presidential election year, the U.S. bishops debate a letter to voters. It is not Catholic teaching that abortion is the preeminent issue that we face as a world in Catholic social teaching. San Diego Bishop Robert McElroy challenges this line from the bishop's letter. The threat of abortion remains our preeminent priority because it directly attacks life itself. At the same time, we cannot dismiss or ignore other serious threats to human life and dignity, such as racism, the environmental crisis, poverty, and the death penalty. I think it has been very clearly the articulated opinion of the Bishop's Conference for many years that pro-life is still the pre preeminent issue. It doesn't mean the others aren't equal in dignity. Obviously, the right to life is essential. Because if there is no life, there is no need for anything else. And that's who the bishops pick as their next president. Archbishop Jose Gomez with 176 is elected the new president. The Archbishop of Los Angeles. Gomez was ordained a priest of the Catholic group Opus Dei, and he's a Mexican immigrant. I think it is a special blessing for the Latino community the bishops followed custom, promoting sitting Vice President Gomez to president. Voting is open. Please vote now. The real election question, who would the bishops pick for VP? 151 votes. Archbishop Alan Vigneron is elected vice president. Detroit Archbishop Alan Vigneron. He's a Michigan native who taught philosophy and led a seminary. The bishops also pick leaders of several committees. Oh, my goodness. How do the bishops break the tie? The older of the two bishops takes the prize. We also learned more about the Vatican investigation into former Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. Cardinal Sean O'Malley of Boston says the Vatican put together a hefty document which will be presented to Pope Francis. And he expects a report will be released soon. Here in Baltimore, Jason Calvi, EWTN News Nightly. Joining me now from Baltimore is Archbishop Jose Gomez, President-elect of the USCCB. Your Excellency, welcome back to the program. You've been a bishop since 2001. You know the workings and the needs of the Bishops' Conference well. In your view, what are the top priorities over the, for the conference over the next three years? Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, it is true. I've been a bishop since 2001, so I think the, uh, we have every three years we change the priorities, we adjust the priorities of what the reality of the, ch of the ch church is at this time. So we are starting a new set of priorities starting this this coming year, uh, and it's basically evangelization and uh, uh, and also uh, uh, helping people to be more active in, in in a missionary work, because I think what Pope Francis is asking us to do, uh, but also continue the time of renewal and reform in the church especially caring for the, uh, the, everyone that uh, has been affected by the hor horrible tragedy of uh, the sex abuse. And we have in every diocese and all over the country an extraordinary program of uh, assistance to uh, healing uh, programs of assistance to the people that have been af uh, affected, suffered by this crisis. And at the same time, we are, again, 
uh, committing ourselves totally as we are uh, to the protection of children. But most important, I think, together with that, I think it is it's beautiful, uh, and, and I think that's what the bishops of the United States would like people to, to, to see, is the so many wonderful works that Catholics do all over the country, in social issues, in marriage, in in, in, in immigration, in every single aspect of the life of society, the Catholics are active, and they are making a big difference in our country. Yesterday, Archbishop Christophe Pierre, the papal ambassador to the U.S., stressed the importance of evangelization. So what are the steps the church in the United States needs to take in the face of an increasingly secular culture that, as you know, often devalues life? And that's what, uh, thank you for your question. I think it was a beautiful presentation of uh, Archbishop Pierre, uh, reminding us that what the Pope Francis is asking us to do is to, to, to go out, to be with people, and to help people uh, to uh, practice their faith in their daily life. And I think that's what the bishops of the United States would like to do in, in the area of evangelization, is really bring the faith to the daily life and to, the, uh, uh, to work and families and, 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 and for people to make a difference. I think the challenge is to go from just an intellectual understanding of your faith to a practical way of living your faith in your daily life. Your Excellency, you are the first Latino and the first immigrant to lead the Bishop's Conference. Today you called for immigration reform that is, quote, possible and reasonable. So what does that look like to you? Um, it's just uh, 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 thank you for your questions. Uh, the immigration is a, is a very important aspect of my ministry since I uh, became a bishop in 2001. And I think what we are trying to do, I'm personally trying to do, is help uh, Americans to understand that immigrants are a blessing for our country. And what we are asking uh, our elected official is to really uh, come uh, uh, come up with a legislation that facilitates the movements of people respecting our borders. I think the crisis that we are, are in now is because, unfortunately, for a long period of time, uh, uh, we haven't been able to uh, adapt the legislation on immigration to the reality of the times in which we are living. So what we are asking for is, yes, respect for, for our borders, but also uh, 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 work visa, and the uh, DACA uh, people that uh, become legal and have the possibility uh, in some way to become citizens. And all of those people that are uh, with no documents at this time to find a way that they can uh, become part of our country legally because they are making a big difference in a positive way in our country. Your Excellency, as you know, we're getting closer to the 2020 election. Many Americans are focused on that. So. How do we as Catholics focus on church teachings and the right way to think about these issues and avoid all of the political rhetoric, all of the polarization in our society today? Um, uh, actually, uh, that today just, uh, we just approved a new uh, uh, document, a new uh, uh, letter that uh, reissues the uh, statement of the bishops of the United States on faithful citizenship. I think an important thing is for all of us Catholics to understand that uh, we can actively participate in public life, as you are saying, based on the teachings of the church. The teachings of the church uh, are basically God's plan for humanity, for the human person and for society. I think it is important for us to know what, what, uh, what exactly the church teaches on that, what is the plan of God for our society at this time, and then act accordingly in public life. Well, I think the new letter, and uh, we are going to have also some videos that are going to be useful for people to learn about more about those teachings of the church and be uh, excited about participating in public life. So many important issues to think about both in the year ahead and for the next three years. Archbishop Jose Gomez, president-elect of the USCCB, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. God bless you all. Congress is gearing up for the impeachment inquiry of President Donald Trump to go public. Live hearings are set to start tomorrow. The impeachment countdown, taking closer to public hearings tomorrow. First, the public will hear from top diplomat to Ukraine, Bill Taylor, and Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, George Kent. 
The former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Yovanovitch, testifies Friday. Their testimonies expected to detail claims alleging President Trump pressured Ukraine to launch investigations for his political benefit. So how will this week's hearings work? House Intelligence Chairman Adam Schiff and Republican Ranking Member Devin Nunes will lead the sessions. They'll have 45 minutes each to question witnesses, with staff lawyers likely playing a big role. All other committee members will get five minutes each to do the same. Meanwhile, President Trump says he'll be releasing the transcript of his April call with Ukraine's leader. House Democrats are focused on a July 25th phone call, where President Trump asked the Ukrainian president to investigate Democratic rival Joe Biden's family. The president tweets, I will be releasing the transcript of the first and therefore more important phone call with the Ukrainian president before week's end. After this week, lawmakers expect at least one more week of public hearings. President Trump has repeatedly denied any wrongdoing, calling the impeachment inquiry a witch hunt. The United Nations highest court is accusing Myanmar of genocide against Rohingya Muslims. The case was filed by the government of the West African nation of Gambia. The world must not stand by and do nothing um, in the face of terrible atrocities that are occurring around us. It is a shame for our generation that um, we do nothing while genocide is unfolding um, right before our own eyes. Myanmar's military began a campaign against the minority Rohingya in August 2017 in response to an insurgent attack. More than 700,000 Rohingya fled to neighboring Bangladesh. Pope Francis visited Myanmar in November 2017. Turkey's president suggests he might release ISIS prisoners into Europe. Recep Erdogan is angry at a decision by the European Union to impose sanctions on Ankara over its drilling for gas in Mediterranean waters. He's threatening to move the militants back to their home countries, even if the countries refuse to take them. Erdogan says his country is not a hotel for fighters. Turkey's president is expected to meet tomorrow with President Trump at the White House. Another round of clashes today between protesters and police in Hong Kong. The incidents came after demonstrators took over a busy intersection in a central business district. Yesterday was one of the most violent days in the nearly six months of anti-government protests. Dozens of people were arrested. Police and protesters also clashed yesterday in Chile. Security forces used tear gas and water cannons to disperse anti-government demonstrators. The country's president is planning to draft a new constitution to try and stop the protests. Opposition leaders say they do not trust the current government to enact change. One day after his resignation, the president of Bolivia has left the country. A picture shows Evo Morales on board a Mexican Air Force plane. Mexico has granted him asylum. The socialist leader stepped down Sunday following weeks of massive protests over a disputed presidential election. Police and protesters continued to fight last night. Security forces used tear gas to disperse demonstrators at a bus station. Coming up. The Supreme Court hears arguments on whether to end the DACA program for immigrants brought to the U.S. as children. Today, the Supreme Court heard arguments on President Donald Trump's decision to end the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, or DACA. It protects almost 700,000 immigrants who were brought to the United States illegally as children. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, White. President Trump announced he would end DACA more than two years ago, but lower courts kept the program alive. Now the debate is at the Supreme Court, and today we spoke to immigrants who could be affected by its decision. Protest outside the Supreme Court. We're human beings. This is not a game for us. DACA recipients known as Dreamers pushing in support of the program initiated by President Barack Obama in 2012. I was able to pay in-state tuition. Um, I was able to work. I have done nothing but contribute to this community. I pay my taxes. I'm starting by co-founded a nonprofit. I employ citizens. Today, the high court heard the case made for these undocumented immigrants. The justices will have to decide if the Trump administration complied with federal law as it tried to end DACA. President Trump has argued the way DACA was created by the Obama administration was unconstitutional. 
Chief Justice John Roberts and Justice Brett Kavanaugh were among the justices who indicated today the administration has provided sufficient reason for wanting to do away with the program. While DACA does not allow anyone with a felony conviction to participate, today the president tweeted, Many of the people in DACA, no longer very young, are far from angels. Some are very tough, hardened criminals. He went on to say if the Supreme Court rules in his favor, a solution could be reached by Congress that would keep dreamers in the U.S. He tweets, a deal will be made with Dems for them to stay. The president himself has talked about the benefits of keeping these folks here. Though the White House and Democrats haven't reached a compromise thus far, Israel Ortega with the Libre Institute says Congress, not the courts, must act. Lawmakers from both sides of the aisle to come together, identify common ground like enhanced border security with protection for dreamers, and I think it can happen. U.S. Catholic bishops also call on the president and Congress to come up with a permanent legislative solution. The USCCB says ending DACA would go against the law and could lead to family separations. We expect the Supreme Court's ruling on this by June. Wyatt. White House correspondent Mark Irons reporting. Thanks, Mark. Join me now from the Bishop's Conference in Baltimore, Maryland, is Bishop Daniel Flores of the Diocese of Brownsville. Your Excellency, welcome back to the program. As you know, the Supreme Court is hearing arguments on the Trump administration's bid to end DACA. How could this impact the hundreds of thousands of people who currently have this protection? Well, the outcome of the, uh, of the Supreme Court arguments um, would have a tremendous impact on the lives of, of hundreds of thousands of young people who came perhaps to the United States when they were two or three years old and now in their 20s or their 30s um, or, or something that are that are established in the country and are contributed. A lot of them have gone to school um, or have jobs and are nurses and doctors. So it would have a tremendous impact on how the what the decision of the Supreme Court is with regard to the to the to their status in the law. And and of course I'm I'm certainly praying and a lot of a lot of people I know back home in the Diocese of Brownsville are are, are praying that that a, that a just solution will be found by which by which they can be recognized as as having a, as having the appropriate status to stay here in the United States. And I'm sure Catholics across the country are joining you in that prayer. In general, what are you hearing from your fellow bishops about the need for immigration reform uh, here in the U.S.? Well, the bishops, you know, as you know, for, I mean, for quite a number of years now, a couple of decades, we've been asking for a for a general. Uh, reform of the immigration system that 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 is um, that kind of more more addresses the con the current reality of, of, of immigration in the country, um, and so what, what I hear from the bishops is that we need to continue in, and to persevere and to encourage our people to continue to ask their congresspersons to to uh, to be proactive in, in kind of formulate a consensus in the Congress and with the administration on what a a a, a family uh, friendly reform would look like. And so it has been an arduous process over the years in trying to get that kind of a consensus. Uh, obviously, it's the work of the political order to try to find a political consensus, and the church prays for that and works for that and encourages that. And our responsibility as bishops in our, in our, in our dioceses is to kind of call our people to, to, to kind of advocate in favor of a humanitarian reform that recognizes the human dignity, but also, and while addressing questions of the law, also recognizes that the law really should respect family unity and issues of, uh, of the just treatment of workers and, and all these aspects that kind of go into a, what I'm sure is, would be a fairly complex reform. The law uh, has to be, in a certain way, adequate to the human situation and not the other way around. And that's kind of, that's kind of a, a, a pretty traditional Catholic view of what the purpose of the law is. And so, and so we're asking for the, for the Congress to step up to its responsibility and the, and the administration, whatever administration is, because we've been advocating for this over a number of administrations uh, to, to, to try to help and find that consensus. Okay, such a very important issue when it comes to immigration. We're going to continue to follow that. But before we let you go, Bishop Flores, this has been a historic day mm -hmm. at the Bishops' Conference with the election of Archbishop Jose Gomez as the next president of the USCCB, the yeah. first Latino to hold that position. How meaningful is this, not only for all American Catholics, but for Latino Catholics in particular? Well, this is very meaningful, I mean, on a number of different levels. I mean, obviously, uh, the, the bishops express their confidence in Archbishop Gomez as a pastor, as a bishop, as somebody who, who can lead. And, and part of the significance of this is that it really is a sign of the of the desire of the church uh, in the United States that, it, that has a Hispanic er heritage with, from different parts of Latin America to, to really be of service to the whole church in the United States. And, and, and obviously, Archbishop, who's a good friend of mine and somebody I deeply respect, is uh, is somebody who can who's been asked to kind of make that 
that, uh, that uh, take that role of, of helping us move forward. And so it is a sign of kind of confidence that as a church we work together, uh, and, and, and it's, it's the important that, that he's a Catholic archbishop who has a sense of the, of the whole church in the United States, and, 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 and it's a sign that, uh, that the, the very diverse uh, Hispanic community in the United States has a lot to offer to the whole church and not just the Hispanic church. And that's an important, an important point to be made. And so, so it's a very happy day for me and for, for, I think, the whole church in the United States. And I'm sure many Catholics would join you in that feeling of happiness with this historic day and this historic election. Bishop Daniel Flores of the Diocese of Brownsville, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. God bless you. November is National Adoption Month. It's meant to raise awareness about the urgent need for families to take in children and youth in foster care. Today, Vice President Mike Pence honored those who adopt children. To all the many families gathered here and those looking on who've answered the call to open your hearts and your homes, it is wonderful to be here at HHS and to be a part of the most pro-adoption administration in American history. Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar also spoke at the event in Washington, D.C. The initiative began in 1984 as National Adoption Week under President Ronald Reagan. President Bill Clinton expanded it to the entire month of November in 1995. Up next, Pope Francis explains why the devil hates humanity. And we hear about a medical center in St. Peter's Square. Qualcuno che ti tocca il cuore per farti andare sulla strada sbagliata. Pope Francis says the devil tries to destroy humanity because he is jealous. At his daily mass at the Vatican, the Holy Father says the devil spreads messages through gossip and slander. We can counter it by asking God to help us ignore the great liar and sower of hate. A temporary medical clinic is open in St. Peter's Square. The clinic offers free medical services to the public. This is in preparation for the World Day of the Poor, which is celebrated this Sunday. Last year, more than 3,500 people were treated by doctors and nurses. Patrizia Piacitelli, volunteer for the Croce Rossini Association, joins us from Rome. Thank you so much for being with us. Tell us what type of treatment is provided at this clinic and who will be coming? Uh, there's a health assistance that provides um, blood tests, uh, uh, gynecology, um, any sorts of, uh, like what you'd find in a hospital um, for any kind of disease. We have specialized doctors and, uh, and the kind of people that come are actually the, the poor that are not only around St. Peter's but also around Rome because maybe you don't know but around Rome we have a lot of poor people, Romans, hmm? and they are welcomed. Uh, they come to us, we greet them, we ask what, uh, what, they're, um, what they need, and we're there to, to help them out. Pope Francis is expected to visit this week. How is the Pope's strong focus on caring for the poor influencing the clinic and you personally? Well, first of all, <laughs> being a Catholic, it's very easy for me. Second of all, as you know, which I would put first, is that Pope Francis is very much for the poor. So this is his third year, and uh, it's, uh, it's very easy for us just to, in the heart, just to be there for the poor and to help them out. So we're there for them. Tell us more about the Croce Rossini Association. Um, it's an association of human values, first of all. So anything that deals with the, the poor, the needy, um, also technically any, any um, if we have to do any kind of, uh, let's say, uh, formation, uh, were there um, any kind of raise funding for them, always dedicated for the values, for the poor, for the needy, for the health, if possible. Whoever needs us, we're there for them. And what made you want to volunteer with the association, and, and what is it like to be a part of it for you? Well, because I have a volunteer in my heart. So I think uh, to be a volunteer is something wonderful. 
because you never know that maybe you one day I might need a hand from another volunteer. So it's a chain of warm heart. And uh, for me, it's very important to be a volunteer and to give what I have, what has been given to me, to share with others. And would you say being a volunteer is rewarding, Patrizia? I mean, does it help you bring you closer to God? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Uh, you ask me if it gets me closer to God. Prayer gets me closer to God, and through that, it makes me closer to my next door neighbor, to my next human being. And through that, I see, especially through the poor, through the poor, just like Pope Francis says, and what Jesus says is, uh, you see the poor and you see Jesus' face. Well, it's so interesting to hear about the association itself and your work as a volunteer. Patrizia Piacitelli, volunteer for the Croce Rossini Association, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. Finally tonight, Pope Francis is visiting Thailand later this month, and an order of religious sisters is working furiously to create a unique vestment for the Holy Father. The Congregation of the Sacred Heart of Jesus Sisters of Bangkok are creating the ceremonial garments for the Pope's four-day visit. The vestments are made of Thai silk. The sisters are also stitching about 200 robes for accompanying bishops. They're working 10 hours a day, and they say God is helping them to finish on time. And I'm sure through God's grace, they will have everything ready for the Holy Father's visit. And with that, we conclude our newscast for tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Wyatt Goolsby. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless.